planets larger than our Jupiter, which is, of course, the biggest planet in our solar system, planets the size of Saturn. We're beginning to find planets the size of Neptune and Uranus that are about 15 times bigger than the Earth. And slowly but surely, we're beginning to find planets smaller and smaller, almost as large as the Earth itself is. You said almost as large, but these are all larger than Earth. Yeah, the smallest planets we've found so far are a few times the mass of the Earth. So what would you have seen from a nearby star if you were looking back at the solar system? What would we have detected? Well, if we looked back at our solar system as seen from, let's say, Alpha Centauri, a star system nearby, we would easily detect Jupiter, hints of Saturn. We would not have been able to detect the Earth, Venus, Mercury, Mars, and so on. So the real excitement is finding the rocky terrestrial planets that so far would have eluded our detection. Can we point to a, a random star and, and say how likely it is that it has planets at all? I believe when you look up into the night sky and you see the twinkling lights, 15% of those stars have Jupiters like our own. Maybe another 10 or 15% have Saturns. The remaining stars, all, I suspect, almost all, have Earths, Venuses, Mars, rocky planets that remind us of the terrestrial planets here in the solar system. As Jeff and I talk, on Hawaii, the giant Keck telescope is being prepared for the night, ready to direct its 10-meter mirror in the search for rocky planets. Well, the interesting thing is that our Milky Way galaxy, within which we live, contains 200 billion stars. Certainly, we can't examine all of them for planets. So what we do is we examine the stars that are closest to our Earth, the ones that you can see with your naked eye and a little bit farther away, out to about 100 light years or so. And the reason we do this is that, frankly, we astronomers are starved for photons. We need the light to analyze that light and therefore, therefore discover the planets. In fact, we have many selection criteria for our stars. One is that they be close and therefore bright. Another is uh, that middle-aged stars and older are better. Uh, middle-aged stars are more quiescent. They're more docile. They don't have magnetic flares and star spots and crazy activity that characterizes the youth of stars. So we frankly avoid young stars, stars younger than about two billion years old, we consider too young to easily hunt for planets. So if these things are common, if rocky planets are everywhere, why haven't you found them yet? Why isn't your job done? Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is that our sun outshines the Earth by a factor of 10 billion. So if you point the Hubble Space Telescope at a nearby star, the poor Earth, even if it's there, is lost in the glare of the host star. So we really don't have a good technique quite yet to detect true Earths. And so instead, we have to look at these things indirectly. Well, there are three brilliant techniques that have all been successful now in finding uh, medium-sized and bigger planets. Uh, one of them is the now famous Doppler technique in which a star is yanked gravitationally by a planet, and so you simply watch to see if the star wobbles in space by the Doppler effect. A, a very exciting new technique in the last few years has been to watch stars to see if a planet crosses in front, dimming the star as the planet transits the face of the star, and that dimming of the star can be measured. And then most recently, some planets have been discovered by gravitational microlensing, which is a fancy word, meaning that the uh, light from a background star bends because of the gravity of the planet, and we can see that bending of the background starlight telling us that a planet is there. The first planets were discovered back in 1995. When did you get involved in this game? When I told colleagues back in the 1980s and 90s that I was going to be hunting for planets with some new technique, they would look down at their shoes, embarrassed, scuffle their feet, and change the subject. So it was an embarrassing uh, pursuit to look for planets back in the 80s and 90s. It was akin to hunting for pyramid power or uh, telekinesis. Uh, and so uh, an, up, uh, you know, an upstanding, proper scientist didn't hunt for planets. Well, you had the last laugh there, I think. Tonight, we're using the Keck telescope. So what's the plan? What should we do with it? Well, we have a sample of about 40 stars that we've been watching very intensely now for, frankly, about two years. Uh, but now we're on a 10-night observing run. We've been using the Keck telescope every night. This is night eight of a 10-night run. And we're monitoring the Doppler shifts of these stars. And in fact, we have a few candidates that we're very excited about. We, we still need a few more measurements to be absolutely sure. 
but as you can imagine, uh, you know, with all of this effort, we are, um, we have a little twinkle in our eye. It's now dark in Hawaii. In the basement at Berkeley, Jeff can check his first results, while 2,000 miles away, the telescope moves from star to star. There we go, all right. This is the second hardest star of the night. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, set to go. Sure. Great. There it is. There it is. Yes, that looks good. Uh, this computer screen tells us the coordinates where the telescope is pointed. Uh, this computer screen tells us the data as it comes in. And what we do here at the back of the Keck telescope, instead of having an eyepiece, we get rid of the eyepiece and the light instead goes through into a spectrometer, spreading the light into its composite wavelengths or frequencies of light. And we store them digitally and then analyze those frequencies of light for the Doppler effect that allows us to find planets.